This is OTB Sports Radio. Very good morning to you. Welcome along to OTB AM. It's uh, Wednesday morning. We're uh, looking forward to another night of Champions League action. We're going to look back at last night's Champions League action. And as ever, if you want to get involved, you can use the hashtag OTB AM. Or, of course, uh, you can get us on Facebook. We'll read the comment underneath the Facebook stream or indeed the YouTube stream. Damien Delaney is with us this morning. Damien, how are you? Very good, thanks. How are you? How's, um, how are these early mornings for you as a, an ex-professional? <laughs> and a fine, actually, you know. Um, with a young kid at home, so I'm used to it. I'm used to it now, yeah. Yeah, I'm fairly used to it, but um, I was looking forward to a nice day in this morning and then realised I had to come in, so... <laughs> Sorry about that. That's <laughs> no, fine. <laughs> the... Um, the uh, Day-to-day -day training regime. Were you like, were you close to the training ground when you were getting up? Was it? Did they want oh, you in early to make sure you were um, not out causing no, any trouble at night? No, no, definitely nothing like that. To be honest, yeah, and they definitely treat you as a, an adult. Right. And if you want the whole they, way through. Yeah, I think if it, right. it's kind of you, 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 that's more kind of kind of when you're you know younger, younger mates when under sixteen, they might tr do stuff like that to try and get some discipline into you. But like, if you still have that trait, you, you usually get weeded out before you got to the certain level. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, you know, if you want to go out and do carry on, you won't be able to train properly, but if you can't train properly, you won't be here very long. So it's kind of self-governing, really. That drink culture that you hear about when Man United were in their pomp and even the Liverpool uh, Spice Boys regime, uh, that, that all disappeared, did it? Um, no, it didn't. Uh, some people would do it, but you wouldn't do it very often, you know. I mean, you wouldn't be out during the week. You definitely have to pick and choose your times, you know. If you, if you were... Um, Going out on a Saturday night and you were off on a Monday if you weren't until Tuesday. You'd That's go fine, yeah. Yeah, you go out on a Saturday night, but I mean, you know, occasionally someone would go out the night before training uh, and come in worse for wear. Would everybody know straight away? Oh, yeah, of course. Right, you, yeah. you could tell straight away because, you know, you'd be sitting in the corner with a hood up. <laughs> <laughs> Just think not to want to go out there. Um, yeah, I've done it a couple of times myself, not very often, but um, yeah, look, it's, it's self governing, really. If you want to do it, you can do it. If you don't, then the queue's on the block for people that do want to do it. So yeah. that's kind of how it is, you know. And d would, would the uh, dressing room have policed it if somebody was doing it a bit too much? Um, not really. But I think no. that it, you naturally would have just fallen away. Right. You know, that's kind of the way it was. If you want to come in and drink, then, you know, and come in worse for wear and you can't train properly, then players would just go, yeah. We've moved on from you now, really, and, and you just get left behind. Yeah, OK. Uh, how, like, was there, how far before you started playing professional football did the midweek clubs actually fail away? I'm trying to get a timeline in my head here, because it's like it's obviously spilled into, like, I want to say 15 years ago, it was still, it's still in its, um, there was still a form of a yeah. midweek club, I want to say. I think, I think from maybe, I want to say from maybe about 2005 onwards, I think it started those players that were in, inclined to do that just started getting left behind because everyone wanted to be successful and if someone's coming in and slowing down training or, or not performing on a Saturday then they got left behind but then you always had a few strange fellas that could go out and do it you know I remember I remember when I was at Leicester um, that was a great change in room and that was it was very regular where fellas would come in um, and you could tell they were out the night before but they could train because they were conditioned for that, so that kind of goes back to you know the Arsenal uh, stories with Tony Adams and Merson and all yeah. them lads. Some people can do it; uh, you can't do it for very long, you know. Um, but you just got found out, and you didn't want to do it anyway because you wanted to be successful. That was your job. Who was the Leicester manager when you were there? Uh, Peter Taylor. All right. Uh, Martin O'Neill just left um, the, the the month before he signed. So, but it was all that Martin O'Neill team that was left over, and there was some. Massive drinkers then. I mean, real... I mean, it wouldn't be that hard to guess some of them. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, some of them, you'd look and you'd go... But then they'd, the one thing about them lads, I'd always say, is that you could tell they were out, but, my God, training was serious. Yeah. No matter how hungover they were, they trained like dogs. Like, that was the one thing. No one ever came in and just kind of, you know, put a, put a hat on and training and strolled around. I mean, if they were out the night before, oh, my God, they'd, they'd be murdering training the next day. Yeah. Yeah, so the... That's kind of the way of doing it, but no one really wants to do that anymore. You know, the level's gone too high now. Peter Taylor seemed like a good manager who got the England job at just the wrong time for him because it yeah. took him out of the cycle of club management and he never really got back into it properly. Yeah, I mean, he was under 21 manager for, for a long, long time and he was the man that actually gave David Beckham the captaincy. Yeah. Um, he was a good manager. He was a very, very good coach. Uh, at the time, he was way ahead of his time, if you, know, if you understand what I'm saying. He was very modern thinking. Um, but I think, if I'm being honest, it was with the, the, the introduction of the foreign players into the, into the Premier League. Because, you know, maybe in the 90s, there was you know, a sprinkling of them throughout the league. But then as you kind of got into the 2000s, they started coming over and changing the culture, the food, the way they looked after each other, the rest. Um, 
you know, I remember foreign players coming in and just like looking, going, how are you lads doing this? How are you out every night of the week? And you're coming in and training the way you're training. And then gradually, you know, the next generation of myself coming through, we tend to gravitate towards those guys, you know, because they were always in fantastic shape. They were yeah. always, you know, they were really serious about what they did. And that's just kind of the way it went, really. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, Liverpool last night, obviously, a little bit tricky for them. They get through in the second half. That was really what it was all about. You, you could tell from the team selection when he went and picked his front three, mm. and that that whole notion of maybe easing off and having the um, the league be their main focus that was was not in Jurgen Klopp's mind at any point either. So, um, having got through that now and come through a little bit of difficulty, that's the type of thing that this dressing room is really going to enjoy. Um, yeah, listen, you know, you could tell his team selection from Bournemouth that he wanted to finish top of his Champions League group. You know, I think when, when, when you talk about prioritising, you don't just say we're going to go for the Champions League, but you kind of take each each problem as, as they come or each hurdle as they come. And I think he had one eye on wanting to finish top of his group. I think he had to just to uh, give himself a potentially easier draw yeah. in, the, in, 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 the, in the knockout stages. So he definitely prioritised it that week, but you've got to give him credit for the way he prepares his team. All 11 players, you know, he, he brought in lads there that hadn't played, like Lilana and, and Origi. They hadn't started the game in, yeah. in God knows how long, but they didn't miss a step, did they? They were at it at Bournemouth and they ran right over the top of them. And then last night he just wanted to you know, rubber stamp that another off out to um, Qatar soon. So uh, I think he's just prioritising hurdles as they come. I think he's probably looking a week or two weeks in advance uh, and he's thinking, OK, maybe I can rotate a little bit here. Um, obviously, you know, with the Champions League knockout stages, he won't be rotating. That'll be, you know, he'll be getting his team ready. But with a 14-point lead, and I know I was going to say they're not 14, they're you know, eight ahead of Leicester, but essentially they're 14 points clear of City, their main challenger. You know, when you get the Champions League, he now knows that the likes of Lallana, uh, Rigi, Shakiri, these guys in Oxley chamberlain can come in and they won't miss a step. And that's a credit to him and his... Uh, is the sports science team really that you can have guys that haven't played football for so long and come in and and be right at the at the level that they're supposed to be at? Are they still getting better? Uh, no, I don't think they're going to get better. I think the only thing going to get better is if they sign players in January. I think that's going to be crucial for Liverpool. You know how serious are they going to take going for a Champions League, Premier League double? Mm. Uh, I know Pep Guardiola has come out and said that they're not going to strengthen in January, so Man City aren't getting better in January. Uh, the only thing Liverpool have to worry about now is an injury. Uh, if you've got an injury to one of your front three uh, and Origi had to play week in, week out from February onwards, you then have to go, OK. But I think they're far enough ahead in the Premier League anyway that at worst, even with Origi or Alana playing regularly, they, okay. they match Manchester City's results, which is all they have to do. Yeah. Um, but when you start getting the Champions League, you will need your starting eleven right at their, at, their, at their peak and right where they're supposed to be. They're talking about Jadon Sancho as somebody that Liverpool are in for because he wasn't happy and then he scored a goal in every mm. game for the last five or six games and it's like, mm, maybe that's going to change his mind about staying. Maybe it won't, maybe he is available. Um, but he's a kid. Like, would, would, is he... I think, I think it'd be a perfect sign for Liverpool. Right. I think it would be absolutely perfect. I always have a little worry in my head that they've had so much mileage out of their front three. I mean, for three seasons now, them guys have been really at it. You'd have to think at some point one of them's going to... I know they're saying Salah's form is hit or miss, but he's still playing really, really well. But you'd have to see at some point one of them is going to get injured. I mean, you worked man here last night. He was like a man possessed again. Mm -hmm. He was brilliant. Uh, and if someone like him got injured, you don't want to be going to an Origi week in, week out. You want to kind of have a Jadon Sancho coming in, a guy who has played at, at that level for Dortmund. Uh, obviously, he's a very, very talented player. And on top of that, uh, Klopp and his staff will definitely be talking the future, you know, uh, if we win the league, how do we kind of reinvigorate the squad? How do we, you know, do win the back-to-back -back Premier Leagues? I know that's really far down the line. They would never, ever publicly talk about that. No, but that's... But there'll definitely be discussions, you know, in private rooms saying, listen, if we win the Premier League now, you know, if this guy's available, will he be available in the summer? If, you know, we need to strengthen and we need to, like, reinvigorate the squad with signings, and I think it'd be ideal. Yeah, it looks like Klopp is there for the long term because what happened at Dortmund was that he got tired of trying to continuously beat the massive superpower. Mm. At Liverpool, he will have enough resources to continually go against Manchester City, and it seems, anyway, that, like, once you knock them off once, mm. I don't know what's going to happen there. When you look at Man City right now, I think they're struggling massively from... Um, uh, they just seem to have gone a little bit stale, you know, and I think Pep Guardiola in the summer, I know they signed Rodri, uh, but you look at the back four they've been left with, you know, they lost company, Angelino's playing 
way too regularly, really, for someone that they kind of bought back because they had a, a buyback clause and yeah. they thought, well, it's only 20 million quid, we'll get him back and he's a left back. But ideally, he didn't want him, you know, he wanted to go and sign, you know, the world's best left back. So, um, I think Man City are struggling from that for a little bit. He didn't reinvigorate the squad with with the big name signing and the guy that could come and hit the ground running. I think Klopp will definitely be looking. No, I know that probably Man City. That's probably something to do with their financial fair play restrictions because I know they were under pressure with that anyway. But I think Klopp will be looking down that road, and I think Sancho will be a perfect one to come in. And if they did want to, if if, they, if Salah did have a, a big drop off, I think he'd be the one to go first out of the three. Uh, if I was going to say anyone. Um, you know, and, and also on top of that, Sancho coming in would reinvigorate the front three. Yeah, yeah. Salah would be the, fir uh, the first as a front three to. Yeah. I think he looks like the one who's going to run out of form first. But that's all, almost like when I asked you there a moment ago, are they getting better? I kind of meant that more in a form sense, and mm. it, it's they're still trending upwards within their season because it seems that one man who is doing that is Mo Salah. Yeah, I think he's he's been okay, but he's he's very hit and miss. Not hit, I know it seems crazy saying that and I'm judging him way by way to It's true by his own standards. He he has been. By the standard he set last year, he's been a bit in and out. No, he's still scoring goals and he's still very very good. But you look at someone like Mane, who just keeps going. He keeps finding another level mm. somewhere along the way. Um, and Firmino's um, work rate and his link-up play and his intelligence, I think he's he's good for another couple of seasons. Um, but also you want to inspire more Salah. I think if Jadon Sancho walks through the door, it might actually focus Salah's mind to go, oh, hang on a minute, I'm under serious pressure here. I need to be like really at it. I think we're on the precipice of Mo Salah banging in four goals in a game at this point. Like He could have done it last night. People <laughs> yeah. will say, well, he's, uh, he's lost his edge in front of goal. I look at it the, the opposite way entirely, is that with his workload over the past two seasons, yeah. he's finally got to a, uh, a state where he's in those positions to, to score multiple goals per game. It's just mad. Dude. I feel really bad judging him by that high, the high standard of, of what it is. But you know, if you're nitpicking and you want to pick the bones mm. out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think th those front three would love to see Sancho walk through the door. I think it'd be a fantastic sign for Liverpool. Young, you know, he'll be there for four or five years. You get four or five very good years out of him. And I think if Liverpool are looking to dominate English football for the next five years, he's definitely someone they should go and get in January. All right, here's what's coming up on the show this morning. Uh, Damien's going to stay with us. We're going to talk about football from uh, 8 o'clock. If you've got anything specific that you'd like to uh, hear us talk about, then you can tweet us using the hashtag OTBAM. Stephen Finn's going to join us around about 20 past eight. He's running a conference for uh, parents whose kids are heading over to England um, as part of the academy system. Um, we'll talk about that then. After that, we've got sports news. Uh, Cluxton versus Galway is today's big debate, so it's uh, it's nearly getting serious. This is the final quarter final. Uh, Luke Keeney, the former Donegal footballer, has sat down with us to talk to us about the hip injury that ended his career. And uh, Pat Smullen was speaking at the HRI Awards last night with John Duggan. We're going to hear from him at around about 25 past nine this morning. So a very busy show. Time for us to get into the papers. OTB AM. Right. I'm going to start with uh, the Irish Times this morning and they have last night's match reports as their lead but uh, the main stuff today is actually uh, Jerry Thorny says Sexton will be fit for Ireland's Six Nations opener so that's a big relief for Andy Farrell and then Gordon Darcy's column the headline is uh, tension between coach and captain can be essential dynamic for success and he says he was in changing rooms where Paul O'Connell would hold Joe Schmidt to account and uh, Schmidt wouldn't back down O'Connell wouldn't back down the two of them would have this kind of Barney and everybody's looking at the Floor going, geez, at some point the parents are going to stop fighting. Yeah. But that it was really important because it pushed Schmidt. Schmidt would never back down. He would walk away, he'd pull rank, and he would come back a little bit later and go, oh, that's interesting. And he says that was missing from uh, the World Cup dynamic over the last year. That's one of the reasons why uh, the situation failed. But he also has this uh, very strong go at um, the process by which the IRFU have been reviewing what happened at the World Cup. Without detail, people read between the lines and conclude that David Nusafor is apportioning blame at the doors of Joe Schmidt and Enda McNulty. That's true. Everybody read the reports coming out from the media who were briefed by David Nusafor that um, essentially it was, uh, we didn't evolve the playing style and the players got too nervous and the, psych the psychology was not right. We need to get more support. Um, most people, uh, Darcy says, most people who worked with both of those men know their true worth. I know I do. A published report with sensitive information redacted would allow everyone to move on before the Six Nations and not just because of the Six Nations. So the report into Ireland's World Cup failure wasn't published. They decided they were going to, the performance director was going to conduct a report and then tell a few journalists what was in the report but not show it to them. He was going to like, he's got 50 recommendations but he didn't, he won't publish it. Um, Darcy goes on, this is the key point. 
this needed to be an independent process, not a new Sephora process. As I said, there's enough blame going around at the moment for everyone to be culpable. Obviously, that includes the coaching ticket, leadership group, other players, and the performance director. The chain of command was new Sephora to Schmidt to Best. None of them can avoid some level of responsibility for what happened. It was actually new Sephora who did the review, though. So if he's at the top of the chain of command, how is it possible that he can conduct a review? Oh, my God, it's rugby. You know, it's, it's like... That's unbelievable. I mean, he's, like, who's supposed to conduct this? The guy who's in charge of the RSU, ultimately he's responsible and he's going to have to apportion blame to somebody. And, and he probably, in the report, he probably took a fair chunk of the blame himself. Didn't take any chance. There's no response. Certainly, the bit that was published had no... Nobody interviewed him. Nobody said, well, what did you do? What would you do differently? Well, he's in charge. <laughs> so what who's going to... Shouldn't that person be held accountable? Yeah, they, they failed at the rugby tournament. No one's like they didn't kill anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, it's a rugby a game of rugby, and the guy's in charge of, of rugby, and he he apportioned blame. Yeah. What is Darcy going on about there, man? No one's died. <laughs> they haven't robbed anyone. I mean, God Almighty. He's going on about the fact that they never learn. That's the point. So how do you get better at something? You hold yourself to account and you go, well, did I do everything I could possibly well, You just said at the top of the show, it's a blessing for Ireland that Johnny Sexton is fit. Is it though? Yeah, because we I talked I, about this last night with the lads. I mean. He's our best player at the minute. Yeah, he's 34. Is he? Is that yeah. right? Yeah, 34 right. now. Right. Is he going to play in another World Cup? Probably not. World so why then are we not building towards a World Cup in four years' time? Well, it's very far away, right? Do we, not, do we, do we put everything into our uh, World Cup performance and at the next World Cup quarterfinal go, right, this is it. This is the only game that matters for the last four years. Right, so listen, when all those lads lost form the year of the World Cup, right, George Schmidt was faced with a choice. Do I stick with what I have? Or do I change it up completely? He probably looked at the lads who would have been available for him to change it up and gone, ah, none of them have really been tested at this level. I'm going to stick with the tried and trusted and hopefully a World Cup will get those guys adrenaline going and they'll perform at a World Cup. OK, so is it not time you move on and find the next Johnny Sexton? Yeah, you've got a bit of time to do that, though. Like, it, it, the, the main reason is that nobody else is fully fit at the moment. So Joey Carberry, who's the anointed successor, hasn't played any rugby since the World Cup because he was injured in it, and um, after that, JJ Hanrahan, maybe he could play in the Six Nations, I'm not sure, but his form isn't at the level yet where you'd say, we can win the Six Nations with him. Uh, Ross Byrne didn't make so the World Cup squad. You're prioritising the Six Nations no, over I just, a World Cup cycle. Well, so I actually think that they, they could say that the Six Nations doesn't matter, but the IRFU prioritise every Six Nations. They have this, like, we make loads of our money from the Six Nations, it's very important. There's a figure of 60, between, between 60 and 80% of all our income comes from the senior national team, right? So if they don't play well, then, uh, I don't know, the income goes down. Like, it's a fairly simple... Because you're prioritising income over the World Cup. They are, yeah. Okay, I... Then fair enough. Then let's all go and play Johnny, Johnny Sexton as many games as you can, but then you can't complain when you go fall flat and you peak two years out from the World Cup. That's, I'm sorry, but, like, you know, you just got to move on. If, if everyone's upset about not going to a World Cup, then you just got to say... We're building for a World Cup, let's go. And let's blood Joey Carberry. If he's not fit, we find another out half. And if that were half, if we find another one. I mean, who knows, you might unearth a diamond, but if you keep going with the tried and trusted... Can I go back to the point you were making at Liverpool about bringing in Lalana and Origi, right? Is it not easier for Lalana and Origi to come into a winning team? Because the team is successful and the culture has been established that we are a winning team. So if, if I'm the Ireland head coach, I'm going into the next tournament goal and I'm going to establish a winning culture and then I'm going to bring people Okay, I'm not saying get years. rid of all 15. No. But there's three or four players there that more than likely won't play in the next World Cup and they've had their go at it. They didn't succeed. The can manager's you, gone. Can, can you win a World Cup without having the culture sta established that this is... So 15 months ago, Sexton was player of the year, right? yeah. world player of the year. Yeah. Is there no way that anybody can come in underneath him and learn and go, actually, that's exactly what I need to do if I want to be the next player? Yeah, it is. And I'm not saying Johnny Sexton should be out, but I'm just saying that you need to start playing. You said, my point was at the top of the show, you said Joey Carter, to bless him for Ireland that he's going to be fit. Yeah. Is it, though? Can he not still be in the squad and Joey Carberry play or the next out half play? If Carberry's fit, I think the chances are that Carberry... Give, give, him the, give him the four games in the, or the five games in Six Nations. See, I think they should have done that last year, right? I think they should have given Johnny Sexton this time last year off and or brought him Australia. back. Australia. The, the tour, let's be fair, you did make that point that when they were going down to Australia for that tour in the summer of, uh, of 2018, that's, that, that was the time to, to give Johnny Sexton off and get Joey Carberry in the team. Now, Carberry looks like he's going to play uh, around Christmas, so he's, he should be available. I uh, hope he doesn't pick up another injury. And I'd kind of be on your side, Damien, if there's any doubt at all over John, Johnny Sexton, 
you've got to see that as an opportunity to actually blood Joey Carberry. But at the same time, if these two guys are fully 100% fit, I think it's tokenism towards Joey Carberry in a certain way to actually just give him the starting 10 jersey. You've got to go and actually try and take this off one of the best 10s that Ireland have ever produced. And that is how you actually earn your stripes as a top-class test out half. I agree. And it just goes back to exactly what we were saying at Liverpool. You need to motivate and inspire him. And if you can get another two years out of Johnny Sexton, he's going to need somebody or he's going to need to feel under threat. Because at the minute, and I think leading into the World Cup, those guys all thought they were set. They all knew they were going to play. You have to play me. Who are you going to play? An untested, an untested, untried person. And that was where you talk about culture. Maybe there was a, an element of comfort crept into that. That's what Roy Best said, that there was a complacency after they got they to the, the top of the world. Which is, which is definitely, I mean, Alex Ferguson used to do it every year. Remember, he used to just call one big name player and it would just send a message throughout the squad. I don't care how good you are, how fantastic you think you are, no one's bigger than this club and I'm the man here. Yeah. You're out. Liverpool haven't quite done that just yet, have they? That's, no, that's because, the next phase. No, well, yeah, exactly. And that's what it does. <clears> they want to dominate English football for the next five years. And I think the rugby is doing that. And Johnny Sexton's been a fantastic pro and he's been brilliant. And I know he's on an IRFU contract tomorrow, so maybe they can call him. But like, you know, thanks for everything, Johnny, but you're going to play for Leinster for the next few years and we're going off in another direction. What's wrong with that? Absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is life, that is football. And if he's smart enough as a player, you've got to recognise that's coming and you walk yourself rather than getting pushed. I would yeah. say if that happened uh, in the year 2020, it would be the most ruthless decision the RFU have oh, ever made. Oh, cares? Oh, glad you go. Thanks for everything, <laughs> mate. Go and play for Leinster. Bear in mind, this is an organisation who don't think they did anything wrong, right? They, so they, they don't hold themselves in any way accountable. They control all the players, they hire all the coaches, they're in charge of everything, and they are like, yeah, nothing to see on our side. It was the players, it was the psychology, it was the game plan. It sounds like massively, though, what you just said there, that they're prioritising money over billing for a World Cup, and they know that a fit Johnny Sexton will give them the best chance of winning this Six Nations, uh, and they're going to play him. Um, I, I, I guess my point is that I'm not really sure that they're, they're an organisation who have a mirror up to themselves going, what can we do to get better? And um, if, that, if you don't have clarity in your decision making, as from the very, what we're trying to do is this, this and this, then you make bad decisions as, but, as but, uh, In fairness, I'll give that guy, the, new, new Sephora, is that? Yeah. New, new Sephora, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you know, he has looked at it and gone, OK, we need to go in another direction here. Maybe they will. He was asked, did anybody interview you? And he's like, oh, no, no, that was a good, no, might be a good idea. In the press conference where he wouldn't tell everybody what was in his report. So my point is, we don't even know what they think. They get a lot of public money, they should be telling us what they think. They, they, they hold rugby in trust, they should be telling us what they think. This is our national team. <laughs> I can't agree with you there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Darcy, to finish on this one. No one's disputing this became an unhappy camp, winning dictates mood, but the IRFU, IRFU review should provide a deep, cathartic study into how a team goes from performing at the highest level to the collapse against Japan in Shizuoka. This can't be achieved without external expertise. New Sephora's presentation last week should not be acceptable to the rugby paying public. The lack of detail means Andy Farrell must turn the page. That's a, I would tend to agree with that, to be honest. I kind of feel like um, they get too free a pass, the IRFU sometimes. Hey, look, man, if, 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 if Ireland don't do well at the next Six Nations, then I'm pretty sure New Sephora's job will be on the line. Well, it won't be. That's the thing. He's got a contract. He signed a new deal. He's, um... Yeah, well, I think, is there a board? Who's he answerable to? Is there a board? Is there a chief executive? Is there somebody? There is, yeah. There is. Yeah, so, I mean, ultimately, if Ireland don't do well at the Six Nations... But they'll blame he... Andy Farrell. That's the thing. They'll blame no, but if he coach. sticks with the tried and trusted, the same players that went to the World Cup, and they don't do well, Whereas at least if he goes in another direction, you can say, listen, then, you know, his actions is proving we Andy need to Farrell go. could do, yeah. He's yeah, and say, coach. listen, we're going to go and, you know, but... What I would say is actually that what, if New Sephora is getting his end-of-year review or whatever it is from the RFU, whoever might give that to him, he's actually going to fare OK because part of his role isn't to do with the Ireland national team at all. It's to do with actually keeping the best players in-house, keeping them at their provinces. And that's something that they've managed to do. It was the, the Joe Schmidt... Uh, plan, obviously it didn't work at all because we didn't get past the World Cup quarter-final um, but what he will say is that there's a, a, a vibrant provincial game being contained here in Ireland and uh, that's all down to him and I don't know if, if the people are still putting bums in the seats during the Six Nations I agree, that, that's ultimately it, you know if, the rugby made, if, okay. if people start losing interest in it then he might be under pressure but I don't know. Uh, The Irish Daily Star this morning on the front page lead with uh, the story about the FAI FAI calls Gardy over 
letter threats. So uh, headquarters in Abbottstown in lockdown as association struggles, uh, a big uh, ramp up of security there uh, inside. Uh, Guardi probe, sinister letters sent to headquarters uh, and then the FAI no-show a committee as well has been mentioned. Back page of the newspaper is through colours, clocks the light as pool progress, uh, party tam for blues, says the headline there with a picture of Tammy Abraham, they beat Lille 2 1 last night. Uh, turbulent times for Tribe, meanwhile, the extent of financial crisis in Galway GEA will be laid, ba laid bare to club delegates next Monday when the loss for the year of over 250 grand will be unveiled. And uh, FAI got it all young. Liam Brady has slammed the despicable behaviour that has seen the FAI sink into a 55 million euro debt crisis, uh, comparing them to uh, Kim Jong-un. Right, North Korea. The, uh, the Daily Mirror back page headline is there, Red Bull gives you wins. There you go, club hails resilient Reds as champs march on in Europe. Um, I didn't see the, much of that game. Did Haaland play well? Yeah, a few chances. He looked good. Obviously, uh, Alisson had to... Co I think Alisson made six saves in the first half alone, um, which kind of shows the pressure with which Liverpool were under in, the, in that first half. Like, I think Phil was saying on Twitter last night that before the game that there's no way Liverpool keep a clean sheet. And they were, I, I guess, fortunate to do so, but it helps when you've got a, a stopper in Alisson between the sticks. He's, he is class, in fairness. But he, he looked good. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, he very... He, I think he's got a bit of passion about him. Like, he, I think... He went, once Liverpool scored, I think it was their opener, somebody threw him a bottle of water thinking it was for a drink, but he actually just took the water bottle and slammed it on the ground, and that was the only reason he wanted. <laughs> Toffee snub by top target. This is the uh, headline here on David Maddox's piece. Everton have been left reeling after one of the top picks to be their new manager withdrew from the running. Vitor Pereira was wanted by the owner, and he'd been talking to the club, but uh, his current club, Shanghai SIPG, have increased his salary to £25 million a year. <laughs> that's 8 million more than Jose Mourinho's earning at Tottenham Hotspur. That's insane. Yeah. Would you not just get into management and try and... For someone we've China? never heard of. Like, <laughs> well, are you what, thinking, what is... I'm going to go and do my coaching badges, spend a couple of years in China and, you know, buy West Cork? <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, you know, if, if, a, if a really high profile job came up, I'm not saying ever that high profile, but I talk of, you know, if an Arsenal came calling from, I think he might, because then you're going to choose your career. But going into Everton, if that doesn't go well for you, yeah. your career's pretty much over there. You yeah, know, you've turned you, down 25 million. You're not going back to China on 25 million there. So, I mean, yeah. Was it much of a decision for you when you were finishing up in the Premier League to go League of Ireland, China? Was there like a balancing act there to go, you know? There was a couple of offers out there, to be honest with you, but the lure of West Cork was too much. You Were know? you not tempted? <laughs> no. No. I couldn't. I, I, um, it just wasn't worth it, to be honest with you. Living um, some of the places that were being mentioned, right. um, I, I, I thought it would be a difficult um, uh, life. And I, I, thought, I just felt that I had my career, um, and to prolong it any longer, and I won't say live in misery for a year. No, your heart wouldn't but, be But you know what, though? I talked to a lot of players, right? And... Um, a lot of players uh, over, my career, over my career have left England for chasing the money. And you speak to them six months later and they're like, I never should have went. Yeah. It, it, the, the England is the best place to play football. Well, bar, I mean, you know, Europe, so let's just say. But, you know, I know guys that went out to Korea, went out to China, went out to Southeast Asia. And they're just like, it's just different out here. It's just, life is different, football's different. You know, the fans aren't as into it. It's just England. That's why I never left, because I always just thought the grass definitely isn't always greener. Yeah, you know? it's fair enough. The London, the London Times this morning leads with Liverpool. Salah special seals English clean sweep four Premier League sides into Europe's last 16. Uh, McElroy makes Sadie stand. Meanwhile, Rory McElroy wading into the sports washing debate by admitting that morality was part of the reason behind his decision to skip next month's Saudi uh, international. And uh, Sutton alleged to have doped. So uh, the barrister defending the former Team Sky doctor, Richard Freeman, at his medical hearing, alleged yesterday that the current coach at British Cycling was involved in an illicit attempt to cheat a drug test. This goes back quite some time regarding uh, some urine that perhaps wasn't urine being contained in a Coke can. Very uh, interesting allegations coming out. Was it not a Coke can full of piss? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, sorry, yeah. That's what it was. That, that yeah. Was, so yeah that, that, sorry, that's exactly what it was. They were saying it was a coke can that may or may not have been coke. Right. It was uh, okay. 100% uh, <laughs> urine. That's the that's the allegation anyway. Uh, who that's from Mary O'Rourke, who's representing Freeman at uh, the General Medical Council. It's like a soap opera at this stage. The, How did he get the the urine from the can into the into the thing in front of? Yeah, the, I don't with know, someone like you know. 
Fugle og wet. Det er like you're spilling it down this thing <laughs> running on. Nej, jeg kunne ikke mene. Ja, det er just now we got away with that. Det er faktisk aldrig, det er very fascinating, yeah. And did he actually get away with it, is the thing. Uh, the Irish Sun, their back page headline is Mo Offense. Fab Salah goal gets Jürgen's approval, and then guns party for Lottie. So Ancelotti is now suddenly available. Our manager of Arsenal will talk with Carlo Ancelotti after he was axed by Napoli late last night. 4-0 win against Genk. You had that great stat. Oh, yeah. Uh, Richard Jolly on Twitter said that uh, Carlo Ancelotti has now been sacked twice after winning a game by four goals. He was sacked as Real Madrid manager after they beat Catafe 7-3 one time as well. They beat Genk 4-0 last night, that is. That's an astonishing stat. Yeah, but I think that his problems go to the off the field stuff. There was a massive story about um, did the owner want to take the players away on a mid season break? The players didn't want to go and they just kind of mutinied. And Angelotti sided with the players, right. which was absolutely fantastic. And obviously that upset the owner massively. And I think he wasn't right there for weeks. So is he a good potential manager for Arsenal? Thank God you should ask, because if you said Everton there, I'd be thinking. <laughs> the, uh, Everton, po uh, the Arsenal, possibly, yeah. Everton, absolutely no chance. Back page, I th but like, is, it, is that the sort of fix they need right now, Arsenal? To sort of get somebody in who knows how to solidify defence and just hold on, concede as little goals as possible, and then reevaluate things in, in the summer? It, like, it doesn't, he doesn't seem like a stopgap sort of guy. You'd, you'd be giving him a three year contract. Yeah, I mean, listen, maybe the lure of London is, uh, it would be too much for him. Um, the Premier League as well, uh, I think it would be a fantastic appointment for Arsenal, not just on the short term, I think you should give it to him and let him kind of steady the ship there for a couple of years. Mm. Uh, back page of the Irish Daily Mail is scandalous, Liam Brady's comments again, Delaney should have got the axe years ago, he said. Uh, picture there of Tammy Abraham, reigning champ, Tammy lands vital blow, but blues in knockout stages. And new era dawns for Offaly under Dignan, Michael Dignan has been elected as chairperson of the Offaly County Board, so uh, he beat the outgoing chairman. Tommy Byrne, who's seeking a fourth term by 76 votes to 62. I was very interested in how that was going to turn out last night. I wasn't sure whether or not he would get it. It's always very hard to beat an outgoing chairman, but you just have to say fair play to the guy because himself, and we've had obviously Di Regan on the show quite a bit, those legendary Offaly hurdlers have been very vocal with the problems that Offaly have had over the years. Now, Di can stepped up and he's going to walk the walk. So. Yeah. Fair play to him is what I say, and uh, actually getting the job as well is, is a good achievement. No, for short, the uh, Telegraph this morning is double delight, and that's a picture of uh, Liverpool and Chelsea going through to the last 16. After Salah's amazing goal, seals victory at Salzburg, and uh, Tommy Abraham strikes in nervy win over Lille. Um, Christian Pulisic playing all right at the minute, isn't he? Yeah, I'm really pleased with Chelsea, really, really pleased with them. Um, pleased with Lampard as well, I think he's done an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, to get them uh, you know, into knockout stages and doing so well in the Premier League. And now he can sign some players too. The back page of The Telegraph has an interesting column and an interesting story about uh, Liam Polwart, who's a 24-year-old New Zealander who is retiring from rugby because of um, multiple concussions. Um, so it's been a difficult decision to leave the game I love, he says. Uh, a short but prosperous career. And um, I think you're probably going to see a bit more of this. Was concussion starting to become an issue in dressing rooms? Were people talking about it? Um, no, not at all. No, absolutely not. To be honest, with you. Um, you usually get tested. At the you know those baseline tests yeah. they give you. So you're starting to get that. But no, not not no, essentially. To be honest, with you. Alan Shearer made that documentary a couple of years ago about all the former footballers who ended up with um, a higher rate of Alzheimer's and mm. general mental difficulties um, later in life. And the cause and effect of heading the football and the old footballs was something that people yeah. were drawing a conclusion from. Um, is that something you would have concerns about? Um, not particularly. Uh, I, I would have headed an awful lot of footballs in my time. Um, I hope it's not, uh, but I, I think the footballs are light enough. Um, there's a few times, all right, where you know you'd get hit in the head with a ball, or you know if you're kind of trying to block a shot and yeah. hit you clean in the head, it would rattle you for a little bit. Um, a few times, I suppose, having can cost, I suppose, but you know, it's not something I even want to think about or worry about. To be honest with you. Were you taken out of those games, or was that something that you kind of? Um, yeah, you kind of do, do the baseline test, and it wasn't a major issue. It's not like rugby where you're getting, you know, repetitive blows in the head. Because I know that they pull players out, but that's going to be troublesome going down the line. I think when you look at what happened in the NFL coming mm. out, I think that's going to be massive in rugby. Yeah, and potentially in football as well. But I'm, I hope not. Okay, the back page of the Herald very quickly is Klopp's Reds top of pile. 
uh, Jordan Henderson's hand in the way of the pile there. A new Dubs boss will be revealed tomorrow. Conor McKeown thinks that the new Dublin Senior Football Manager may be revealed at tomorrow's annual convention, as had been intended. So there's a picture of Desi Farrell there, uh, which I guess means that, yeah, it remains the favourite. Although speculation last week linked both Tommy Conroy and Declan Darcy to the job, while there were also reports that Pat Gilroy had been given first refusal. What's your information on that? Uh, on the Dublin job at yeah. the moment, it's uh, Desi the front runner, uh, certainly. But like the, the Conroy inclusion last week, I think, took everybody by surprise. Uh, back page of The Guardian is Mo Salah. Staying power is the headline. Klopp hails Salah's miraculous finish as Liverpool survived scare. It was quite an incredible goal from Mo Salah last night. Uh, athletes, meanwhile, around and spineless WADA over Russia van. This is a highly respected British member of WADA questioning her future. This is uh, Victoria Agar, a retired Paralympian. She called uh, the decision by WADA spineless and appalling to not issue an outright ban on Russia from international sport. Uh, you've also got a, a line on Spurs there. Cessna on set for Tottenham chance against Bayern Munich, of course. Hopefully Troy Parrott will also get his chance. And cheat mode, uh, what golfing with Trump reveals about the president. Rick Riley has been in conversation with Donald McRae. The uh, Racing Post, Balding drops rookie riders over apprentice pay disputes. Andrew Balding has informed four aspiring jockeys who were due to start their careers in racing in his Kingsclear yard next summer that he can no longer afford them and can no longer offer them employment at a stable due to the new <coughs> BHA rules on apprentice pay. That's the back page of that. The Irish Examiner leads with Mo Salah as well. Mo Magic, Salah Stunner, helps Red secure Euro progress. Uh, Donald Lenehan is saying uh, Larimer is ready to be Ireland's starting fullback in the Six Nations. I think everybody's on that bandwagon at the moment. Uh, not that it's a bandwagon, I think there's a lot of proof for that. He's probably going to start a fullback at the Six Nations. Uh, border crossing, Oshie McConville admits to Brexit fears. Uh, I had an epiphany how Stephanie Cotter conquered her darkest days. Uh, Ruby Walsh and Pat Smullen were honoured at the HRI Awards last night. And uh, Kieran Shannon, GA need to rethink Hurling's crossbar challenge, which is the hook being the new slitter, the point being the couple of questionable scores that may or may not have happened in Croke Park. The Independent, their front page, FAI steps up security as workers targeted by threatening letters. The FAI has ramped up security at its Abbottstown HQ after suspicious letters were sent in the post. Um, so they're obviously working with the Guardi for that one, and then I'll give you the back page. And it's actually an ad for Chanel, because it's Christmas time, so uh, their main lead is talking point from Dan. The questions that the FAI cannot run away from, even though they are continuing to run away from. So that's it. Are you done with your papers? I am indeed. Right, I want to bring you this then, because we mentioned this a little bit earlier. A little bit later on this morning, we're going to bring you the story of Luke Keeney, who's a former Donegal footballer who, after 10 years of inter-county college and club football, was forced to retire at the age of 25 after multiple surgeries and crippling injuries as a result of playing Gaelic football. I met Luke at the GPA's Player Welfare Conference, Balance 2020, and the GPA played a crucial role in the story, which we'll get to a little bit later on. Just before 9 o'clock, we're going to bring you part one of Luke's story. The full 70-minute piece is going to be up on our podcast and YouTube channel. We'll also bring you another segment tonight on the radio at 8 o'clock. But first... Here's Luke talking about when he realised just how bad his injuries actually were. 